السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته بسم الله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين it's a great pleasure to uh, speak to you today on uh, this hot issue the uh, ebola and uh, i've taken this opportunity to talk to you about viral hemorrhagic fevers in general uh, just to give you an overview of what it means and how we classify them and the viruses that cause uh, this syndrome and then focus on two of them uh, Ebola and another one that is also uh, occurring here which is Al-Humra virus, hemorrhagic fever in addition to dengue which is also much more common than both of them uh, but we're all familiar with dengue so I'm not going to talk about dengue uh, I'm sure all of you are well familiar with it so I'll just uh, give you a definition of what viral hemorrhagic fevers mean and uh, classification and then uh, the viral hemorrhagic fevers in Saudi and then modes of, modes of transmission then briefly on Ebola, Humra and I'll leave dengue. So viral hemorrhagic fevers are a group of illnesses that are caused by distinct uh, group of viruses, several of them. And uh, it is used to describe uh, severe multi-system disease where you have damage of the vascular system often leading to bleeding manifestations. So you have an acute illness with bleeding manifestations. But bleeding is not a must to diagnose viral hemorrhagic fever. You can have somebody with viral hemorrhagic fever without bleeding, yet you can still suspect viral hemorrhagic fever because of other features that such patients may have, such as, say, prolonged PTT, high CK, high LDH, low platelets, low, low white blood count, etc. So bleeding varies. It, it may occur in down to, say, 1% of cases up to 50-60% of cases. The bleeding itself is really life-threatening. Okay? And while some types of uh, hemorrhagic fever viruses may cause relatively uh, mild disease, such as dengue, for example, which usually causes really very mild, self-limited disease in 86% of cases. And in 10% of cases, you tend to get more severe illness. And rarely you get viral hemorrhagic, uh, dengue hemorrhagic fever where you may, may have fatalities. Uh, other viral hemorrhagic fevers are usually very serious, such as Ebola, for example, Marburg. These are usually fatal. Uh, infections. This is how we classify uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers. We have four groups that cause this syndrome. Uh, alphabetically uh, mentioned here, Arena viridi, which includes these viruses, Lassa, Genin, Machopo, Granarito, and Sabia, and Lujo. Uh, all of them are not reported in uh, Arabian Peninsula. Most of them, Lassa, Janin, Elisabia, are reported in South America, and, and this Loju is reported in South Africa. The Bunia Viridi includes two in diseases that were reported for Saudi Rift Valley Fever, which caused a big epidemic back in the year 2000, and we also have Crimean Congo, hemorrhagic fever, uh, another uh, Bunia virus. And then we also have the Hanta virus, which causes two syndromes called hemorrhagic fever with renal syndrome and Hanta virus pulmonary uh, syndrome. The third group, which is uh, the focus of our topic today, is the Thilo Viridi. Thilo means phylum, phylum, khayt, khaytiya, the filamentous viruses. And we have two viruses in this group, Ebola and Marburg. And then the last group is the Flaviviridae, Safra, uh, which includes two viral hemorrhagic fevers reported to Saudi Dengue, particularly in Jeddah and Mecca, and Al-Khumra, particularly in, in Najran, Mecca, and Jeddah. And we also have other flaviviridae in this group, such as tick-borne encephalitis, the OMS hemorrhagic fever virus, Chiasenor forest disease, and yellow fever, Hummus safra. But only the red ones 
are reported sorry five one important features common features of of, of the, these viruses is that they are zoonotic they are zoonotic related to animals so the reservoir is usually an animal that infects the human beings okay except dengue dengue is the only one that is not zoonotic Let me skip this one. Let me just give you a brief account on each of them, just to know what what the animal reservoir for for these groups, just to have an overview before we focus on on uh, Ebola. The arena viridae, which includes Lassa, is mainly uh, maintained by rodents and special types of rodents. I'm not going to mention the strains. Each of them have different rodent strains, but in general, all of them, all the arena viridae are maintained by rodents, al-fi'ran and qawarid okay. San Jinin, Machupu, Guanarito, Sabia and Luju all of them have rodents as common reservoir how about Bunia Viridi? the reservoir in Bunia Viridi the, in Rift Valley Fever is sheep, goat, cattle and camels as well so livestock animals these are the reservoirs for the Bunia Viridi beat Rift Valley Fever as well as Congo Crimean Hemorrhagic Fever and as you know Rift Valley Fever is transmitted by two modes of transmission direct contact with these animals or mosquito bites okay? and any species of mosquitoes can do this even Culex whereas the Congo Crimean Hemorrhagic Fever is transmitted by two things contact with animals or three things contact with, with animals and pick bites as well as from human to human. Unlike Rift Valley Fever, Rift Valley Fever is not transmitted from human to human. Whereas Congo Crimean Hemorrhagic Fever can be transmitted from human to human, particularly in healthcare setting. And if, if such patients often present with acute abdominal pain, and surgeons often open them up unknowingly that they have a viral hemorrhagic fever, and they may get infected. And, and this is what, what's serious about this. And it's usually a fatal disease. It's one of the very serious viral hemorrhagic fever diseases. The Hanka virus, which is another Bunia virus, is maintained by rodents as well. Now, this is the Filoviridae, the animal reservoir, Ebola. It, it is not yet very clear as to which animal is the reservoir of, of Ebola, but it is believed, strongly believed, that food bats, pictures of which are, are shown here, are the definitive reservoir of, of this deadly virus. Other animals can also get infected, like the human beings, like, for example, chimpanzees, uh, gorillas, monkeys, all strains of monkeys, are also susceptible to Ebola infection. Okay. Also forest antelope and porcupines. It's an, an animal like, like, like a kunfu, porcupines. So these animals are the definitive reservoir of, of Ebola virus and usually what happens is that human beings get infected by, cons by, consuming, by consuming animal meats from these animals or by handling them directly, Be it, even if they are dead. If you touch any of these animals, if, if they are infected, then you can get uh, infected. So human beings get infected originally from animals and then what happens they spread the disease spread from human to human very very rapidly and this is very similar to MERS corona we believe that MERS corona has very similar behavior MERS corona is originally acquired from animals like camels which is now the top uh, possibility and then it, it is transmitted from human to human rapidly particularly in the healthcare setting exactly like Ebola uh, theory. Okay, now the flaviviridae, which is the yellow, yellow viruses, uh, include dengue, which is transmitted by special mosquitoes uh, called, dengue, uh, called Aedes aegypti, and it doesn't have any animal reservoir. And then al Khumra virus, al Khumra virus hemorrhagic fever, which I'll talk in, about in details uh, later on, and we, this virus is transmitted mainly by direct contact with animals like 
sheep, goats, and camels, as well as by vectors suspected to be either mosquitoes, any species of mosquitoes, or ticks. Uh, so on soft ticks or hard ticks. Okay. The, in the flaviviridae, we also have the tick-borne encephalitis group, which is also maintained by ruminants, such as cattle, goats, sheep, garrafes, uh, yaks, uh, deer, camels, uh, llamas, antelope, dogs, and, and birds, and, and rodents, and carnivores, say usud, and horses. So this is really has widespread animal reservoir, this disease. It, it's not common here, but Alcumar virus is considered to be like a, a strain very related to the tick-borne encephalitis virus. We also have another one called OMSC hemorrhagic fever, which is also maintained by rodents and transmitted by ticks, like the tick-borne encephalitis virus. We also have the Chiasinal forest disease, very, very similar to Alcumar virus, and it's transmitted by ticks and maintained in, in nature by porcupines, rats, squirrels, uh, mice, and shrews. Yellow fever is transmitted by mosquitoes, Aedes, and it is maintained in nature by monkeys. Okay. So as you could see, all of the viral hemorrhagic fevers are zoonotic except the dengue. And the animal reservoir for such infections is usually rodents, uh, livestock animals, uh, and monkeys. Okay, this is just a summary of, of the infections that I mentioned and uh, to indicate which of them is zoonotic, which I've already mentioned, and which of them is vector-borne, and which of them can be transmitted from human to human. Not all of them can be transmitted from human to human. As we said, all of them are zoonotic. Even these ones that have query, there's strong suspicion that they are also zoonotic. The only exception is the dengue. The, vec the, uh, the vector-borne ones are none of the arena, the really. And in the Bunya Veridi, we have mosquitoes as a vector for Red Valley fever and ticks as a vector for congo Crimean hemorrhagic fever. And then in the, in the Philo Veridi, vectors play no role. Like mosquitoes don't transmit Ebola or ticks. And in the flaviviridae, we have dengue and alhumra, which are, are, are transmitted by mosquitoes and, and, and ticks. And also the other ones, are the tick-borne encephalitis, the OMSC hemorrhagic fever, Chiasinal forest disease, transmitted by ticks. And then the yellow fever is transmitted by mosquitoes. Which of them can be transmitted from human to human? We have Lassa fever. We also have Machupu, Granarito, Sabia, and Luju. All of these arena viridae viruses group can cause human-to-human -human transmission. A Rift Valley fever is, is not, sorry, this, this is a mistake. I, I should correct this. The congo creme hemorrhagic fever can be transmitted from human-to-human, -human, but Rift Valley fever does not uh, uh, infect others. The Ebola virus, of course, it's well known to be easily transmitted from human-to-human. -human. Okay. Now, the mosquitoes that can transmit infections include the Aedes aegypti, which can cause dengue, can cause yellow fever, and another non-viral hemorrhagic fever, but may mimic dengue, which is known as chikungunya. Okay? All transmitted by the Aedes aegypti mosquitoes, which have uh, white dots on their body. We also have the Culis mosquitoes, which can transmit Rift Valley fever, West Nile encephalitis virus, filariasis, Japanese encephalitis, and St. Louis encephalitis. And you know we have also an anopheline mosquitoes that can transmit malaria. So these are the mosquito species. So not all of them can transmit uh, viral hemorrhagic fever. Only certain species. This is the viral hemorrhagic fevers that have been diagnosed in Saudi The congo Crimean caused an outbreak in 1990 in, in Mecca. Dengue. Uh, was diagnosed first in 1994 and has since been causing a lot of infections, in particular in Jeddah and Mecca. The Mecca one was discovered when we were in Hajj back in 2004, and we, we're still having uh, transmission of this infection in Mecca. 
Rift Valley fever caused big epidemic in 2000 until 2001. Alhamdulillah, since then we haven't had any case, Fadlullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it occurred in Jizan, Tahamat Asir, and al Gumfuda. al Khumra hemorrhagic fever virus was first diagnosed in 1996, 94, sorry, uh, with six cases from al Khumra region, from Jeddah. And this is why it is named al Khumra. And then in 2001 and to 2003, we identified also 20 cases during Hajj as well uh, in Mecca. And then in 2003 till 2009, we identified 78 cases in Najran, and this have been, have been reported. And then from 2009 to date, we've had some cases reported from Najran, Mecca, Jeddah, one in, uh, a few in Apaif, and one in, in Jizan. So these are the, the viral hemorrhagic fever diseases that are known to occur in Saudi. This is the number of uh, al Khumra virus uh, cases from January 1995 till August 2014. The total number in Najran is 322 Khumra virus cases. Uh, the red is Najran. The green one is Mecca. We, a total of 59. Jeddah, we have a total of 57. In Jizan, we have one case. And for five, we have four cases throughout this period. But I, I think, I, I strongly believe that this disease is underdiagnosed it, it, because it mimics dengue. looks like almost like dengue. And it is easily missed by, by the treating physicians. If we keep an eye on it, you'll find that we, we do miss a lot of cases, particularly in Jeddah. Now, let us just focus on Ebola. It's one of the numerous viral hemorrhagic fevers that I, I listed. Uh, it's a severe, often fatal disease in humans and non-human primates, such as monkeys, gorillas, and chimpanzees. And uh, it's caused by uh, a virus from the family, as I said, filoviridae, uh, genus Ebola virus. And uh, usually, the disease causes an abrupt onset of of illness, like suddenly, sudden onset of illness. This is how these viruses look like. They are just like filaments. This is why they, they are known as filoviridae, or filamentous viruses. This is just one of the patients uh, in, uh, in Africa. This disease is, is known to be uh, an African disease uh, that was Origin discovered in 1976 in what is now known as the Democratic Republic of the Congo, previously known as Zaire. Previously known as Zaire. This was where the first uh, occurrence of this virus happened. Since then, outbreaks have happened uh, sporadically in, in the African Horn. We have five identified species of Ebola virus. Uh, Four of them cause human disease. The fifth one does not cause human disease. It's mainly affecting monkeys and maybe pigs and does not cause human disease, even though it may cause human infection. The fifth one. It, it causes seroconversion, but patients don't get ill with it. So the, the, the human ones include uh, Zaire Ebola virus, with Sudan Ebola virus, with Thai forest, uh, Cote d'Ivoire, you are Sahel Raj, originally discovered and uh, Bundibugyu, a strain, uh, which is the fourth one that may cause human disease. The mortality rate related to these species is different. The highest is with the ear strain. It's about 80%. Sudan strain is about 50%. Bundibugyu is about 27%. Reston, uh, Ebola virus, which is an animal one, did not cause any, any disease or mortality. And the Thai forest in uh, uh, Cote d'Ivoire uh, not, did not cause mortality. The natural reservoir, as I said, is not known. But on the basis of evidence, it, uh, the, uh, the animal reservoir that is suspected to be uh, maintaining this virus is the fruit bats, as I previously shown. Right. There is a, a, a habit in Africa, they eat wild animals. In Islam, as you know, in Islam, 
we're not allowed to eat anything that has makhlab or, or canines. Like any animal that eats meat, we're not allowed to eat in Islam. Yahrum. We can only eat animals that eat vegetables or, or plants. But we're not allowed to eat cats, for example, or dogs, or or carnivores, or, or grood, anything that has nails, makhalib, or, or uh, canines, uh, we are not allowed to eat. In Africa, the situation is different. Many of them are not Muslims. They eat uh, wild animals, including monkeys, including uh, porcupines, uh, anything they, they, they eat. Similar to, to China. Also in China, when, when the SARS happened, it was also related to consuming uh, civet cats, meat, yaklul gitak, no mayan menudisis. Four of the five subtypes occur uh, in an animal host native to Africa. Uh, a resting virus, which I said is, is uh, a non-human pathogen, uh, mainly affects the, uh, this uh, species of monkeys, the cinemologous monkeys. And it doesn't cause really human disease. It mainly causes disease among monkeys with viral hemorrhagic manifestations and can be transmitted to humans, but it doesn't cause illness. And it has also been recently reported in pigs as well. So this virus is not that important. This is just summary. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it for you, for those of you who are interested to read the, the history of, uh, of Ebola. Uh, since the beginning in 1976 in Zaire where we had 318 cases 280 of them died so 88% mortality then in Sudan we had 284 England imported cases from Sudan uh, one, uh, with uh, one case and he survived in Zaire another case and then you'll see that you have history uh, of, of what happened. I'll not go into detail of this, but let me just show you the last events that happened this year, uh, which is uh, here in 2014, okay, since March. Uh, actually, it started earlier, in, maybe in December 2013, but we've had a big epidemic of this disease in Guinea, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and lately a limited uh, cluster in Nigeria. And this epidemic is still ongoing, and this is why we are talking about Ebola, because we have just some concerns that we may get cases through traveling from, from these countries. So you really have to be aware of this disease, because it is highly infectious, you can get infected if you don't take full precautions when, when such patients present to the hospitals. Recently, just a few days ago, another epidemic unrelated to West Africa was also announced by the WHO, and it's occurring in the Democratic Republic of, of the Congo. 25 cases happened, and these 25 cases, interestingly, were linked to one woman who was pregnant uh, her husband captured a wild animal and gave it to her to, to butcher and cook. She got infected from, uh, by Ebola and she died. She was pregnant and in the rituals, they cannot bury a pregnant woman without removing the baby. So they took her after death to the hospital. They removed the baby and they then buried her. The, all the doctors and the nurses who looked after this patient got infected and many of them died. Okay? Among the so most of the 25 cases were actually healthcare workers who, who dealt with this woman who was pregnant with Ebola virus. And they didn't know that this was Ebola until the samples were sent to the WHO and it was confirmed later on. So this is another interesting story where the patient gets, gets infected from the animal and then it's just one case and then spread it to 24 people who had contact with her. <clears throat> this is now the situation in, in, uh, in Africa. <coughs> this is in, in Guinea. In Guinea, we have, <coughs> we have a total of 700.
771 cases, 494 of them died. But not all of them are confirmed, even 579 confirmed, 59% of them died. Liberia, we have 403 confirmed, but the number with probable or suspect is, is really far more. So a total of 1,600 even, or 1,700 cases in, in Liberia, 51% of them died. Uh, Sierra Leone, we have even 1,100 confirmed and 1,200 total, 39% of them died. So these are the, uh, the if African countries where the disease has uh, spread dramatically. The total number of patients that we have so far, including confirmed, probable, and suspected cases, is 3,685 3, cases. 50% of them died. If we look uh, at, at, at other two countries where limited transmission has occurred, we have Nigeria. We have 16 cases confirmed to have Ebola. Six of them died. And we have other suspected cases or probable cases. The total is 21 cases. But all of them were linked to one Liberian-American patient who got infected in Liberia and traveled to Nigeria. He was trying to go to the States to be treated because he knew that he was having Ebola. So he, he thought that he would die if he stays in Liberia. So he was trying to to fly fast to uh, through Lagos to the States, but unfortunately he got very ill in the airport and they took him. And this patient spread the infection to to the rest of the cluster. Now a total of 20 patients. Many of them were healthcare workers. Okay, and primary, uh, secondary, and tertiary transmission has occurred from this case. Recently, which is a surprise. A case happened in Senegal, a single case, that did not have any travel history to West Africa. It, Senegal is also in West Africa, but they did not travel, this patient did not travel to, to Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, or Liberia. <clears throat> this is uh, a map summarizing what I've just said. This is the African countries. This is Saudi Arabia, that is Sudan, just to orient you. And this is Uganda. The hottest area where uh, uh, Ebola has occurred is, is the Democratic Republic of Congo. We have a total of seven outbreaks, and a total of 991 in these seven outbreaks, including the last one, the 25 patients who got infected from the pregnant woman. Uh, Uganda is also known to have out, uh, to have had outbreaks. Five outbreaks occurred in Uganda with 592 cases. Sudan, three outbreaks with 335 cases. Uh, Congo, it's, Congo is different from the Democratic Republic of Congo. And they, they, it had three outbreaks of uh, Ebola with 235 patients affected. And we also have Gabon uh, with four outbreaks, total, total of 214 patients. We had one case reported uh, with two patients secondary infected from it in South Africa. Also one report from uh, Cote d'Ivoire. And uh, this report from Senegal and one outbreak, uh, this one outbreak in Nigeria. But as you can see here, this outbreak in Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia is the biggest outbreak ever in history. Just one outbreak, now we have more than 2,000 confirmed cases, just in one outbreak. And now more than 300,000 uh, suspected cases. So, so this is really the biggest Ebola outbreak in history. And this is why we're concerned, because it's really potentially able to spread to other countries through traveling. So, what are the early symptoms of Ebola? The incubation period of Ebola is about 2 to 21 days, but usually 8 to 10 days. Okay. 
Patients are infectious only after the onset of infection. I'll give you the example that the case we had. You, you've heard of, of this man who, who unfortunately died here. This man died about uh, a month ago or so. He, he visited Sierra Leone for, uh, for business. And then eight days after his arrival, on the way from Al Baha to here, he had acute onset of fever, chills, and vomiting. Okay. And then when he presented to a private hospital, he was having prolonged PTT, low platelets, low white count. So they consulted me, and we suspected that he may have Ebola, uh, given the fact that he was in, Sir, uh, in, uh, in uh, Sierra Leone. So we transferred him here, and he was really in very bad shape. Uh, Allah yarhamu, he died. Okay. And do we, did we have to trace his, uh, the contacts who were with him in the airplane when he flew to, to Jeddah? Do you think we should have done this? The onset of his symptoms was taqiyun fa awal yom al-Eid, if I remember correctly. He, he returned back from uh, Sierra Leone to Ashin Ramadan. Ramadan. So there was 10 days, or 8 days after his arrival. So do we have to go and trace back the, the attendants, the, the, the people who attended with him in the flight? No, we don't have to do this. Simply because the patients become infectious only when they have symptoms. So before the onset of symptoms, you don't care about who had contact with this patient. But you do care about those who had contact with the patients after the onset of illness. So you really have to trace them. You have to keep them in a logbook and follow them on daily basis because they may get symptomatic within the incubation period which is uh, at most 21 days. By the way, that patient's lab results have, have been negative so far in, in uh, two international labs, the CDC and Germany, as well as in our own lab in, in King Abdulaziz University. So we're still searching for uh, an etiology. Many who recovered from the disease, uh, sorry, the patient is infectious throughout his, his illness. So during the symptomatic stage of the disease, the patient is infectious. After the symptoms have recovered, the, pa the men may continue to be infectious through the semen for up to two months. So men who have recovered from Ebola may infect their wives if they, they have sexual intercourse. So we really have to give them advice to avoid sexual intercourse for at least two months. Symptoms include fever, severe headache, muscle pain, weakness, diarrhea, vomiting, abdominal or gastric pain, lack of appetite, and bleeding manifestations. This is just some pictures of patients who've had Ebola. You may have bleeding from the nose, known as epistaxis, can have gastrointestinal bleeding, upper GI bleeding. You can have cutaneous bleeding manifestations. You can have hematemesis. You can also have echomotic patches in the patients. You can have bleeding from the gum. So bleeding can happen actually both in the, in the skin, in the form of petechiae, bruises, uh, echomosis, and can also happen from mucous membranes, such as the gums, the nose, and can also happen from the stomach, upper GI, or lower GI, hematochesia, and can also happen from the, vagina, from the uterus, vagina, in the form of vaginal bleeding, or hematuria, in the form of blood in the urine, and can sometimes be microscopic hematuria. So you have to check the urine for RBCs if you have a concern about viral hemorrhagic fever. Because of the natural reservoir of Ebola virus uh, uh, has not been uh, proven, the manner in which the virus first appears in a human at the start of an outbreak is, is still unknown. But we all believe that the first introduction of this virus is through contact with animals, okay? even dead animals. After the contact with animals, the disease spreads really fast among humans. And how is it transmitted from human to human? This is very important. And this is really a very important take-home message from, from this presentation, is to know how the virus is transmitted from human to human. 
First, you have to know that it's not only the live person or the live animal that can infect that, uh, the, uh, people, also dead bodies. Dead bodies can be infectious. Okay? So contact with blood or other body fluids from a live or a dead person contacting or having direct contact with these bodies without wearing barriers may well transmit the infection. And this includes not only blood, but also urine, saliva, feces, vomit, sweat, which is interesting. For example, HIV cannot survive in, in sweat, but Ebola may survive in sweat, even though it's a very salty solution, but this virus can survive it. Sputum and semen. All contact with body fluids from alive or dead infected animals may also be the cause. And also to contact with objects, such as, say, needles or other uh, equipment contaminated with the patient's secretions. The virus is also suspected to be transmitted by droplets. If you just come in, in, in close contact with the patient, you can get infected by having the virus in the droplets inhaled by, by the Sankhalayu. So the mode of transmission of this uh, virus, deadly virus, is believed to be through direct contact with, with body fluids as well as droplets, but not airborne, not really airborne, unless you're doing an airborne or aerosol generating procedures, such as, say, intubation or suctioning, then airborne transmission may happen, in which case you have to take the airborne precautions. Healthcare workers and family and friends in close contact with the Ebola patients are the ones at highest risk uh, to get infection, uh, getting infected uh, by the Ebola source. <clears throat> so it's important to know that uh, during outbreaks, the disease can spread quickly within healthcare setting. And in, in, in some of the outbreaks that happen in Africa, Hospitals closed, actually, because the healthcare workers died in Africa. Many African countries, outbreaks, caused death of all the healthcare workers in the hospital. And they just closed the hospital because they were no doctors or nurses. Very, very serious. Very serious disease. So you really have to be aware of this. And simple, following simple, basic infection control measures will actually control spread of this disease very easily. So proper cleaning and disposal of instruments, such as needles and syringes, uh, is, is really vital to, to control the, uh, any outbreak. And if instruments are not disposable, they must be sterilized. For example, stethoscopes, uh, thermometers, sphygmometers, anything that you use for an Ebola patient must be disinfected. The way we do for other patients, these also same Equipment should be disinfected from patients to patients. So if we just follow standard precautions, we should not run into any problems. But sometimes we, we do have some gaps in, uh, in our practice. <clears throat> so what do, you, what do you do if you have a case of suspected Ebola? Where should we keep him? <clears throat> you should put them under contact and droplet precautions. And I suppose you know the difference between contact, droplets, and airborne precautions, so I'm, I'm not going to go into this. <clears throat> so, you have to put the patient in a single room on, on his own, and this, this single room should have an adjoining dedicated toilet that is used by this patient alone. No staff, no other patient should use this toilet. It has yellow fever, because yellow fever is transmitted by mosquitoes, like dengue. So, if you have a patient with dengue or, or yellow fever, it's not transmitted from human to human, but you do have to keep the patient in a, in a room that has at least screen to prevent mosquitoes from going on and getting infected. The door should be closed, and you should have restricted access to this patient. Visiting is not allowed at all, unless there is really uh, essential needs, like for example a guardian or a mother or a father of, of a baby who needs to stay with the baby to, to control him. Otherwise, visiting is not allowed at all when, you are, when you're dealing with a patient with suspected Ebola. <clears throat> if isolation rooms are unavailable, you can cohort patients in specific confined areas while rigorous, rigorously 
keeping suspected and confirm cases separately. If you decide to cohort, don't cohort suspected with confirmed because the suspected may not turn out to have Ebola. So you have to keep the confirmed one together. Suspected ones you can maybe keep together in a, in a common room if you wish, but you have to make sure that the distance between the beds is at least one meter. <clears throat> Ensure that clinical and non-clinical personnel are assigned exclusively to e Ebola uh, virus disease patients, care areas, and that members of the staff do not move freely between uh, the EVB isolation areas and other clinical areas. This is really another important principle in Ebola management is that you have to dedicate staff to look only after the Ebola case. That staff should not go and look after any other patient. Okay? Even if, if she has one patient, then she should stick to him. Just one patient for the patient, one nurse for the patient. And you should not look after any other uh, patients to prevent cross-infection. Limit the number of per persons entering the patient's room to those essential for care. As I said, visiting is not allowed except for those who have to go in. Maintain a log of all persons. If somebody has to go in, say a doctor, a nurse, um, whoever, you have to write his name on, on a logbook before entering so that you keep track of such patients. And you have to make sure that whoever is, is going to enter should wear the full PPE before they enter. And there should be, it's, it's preferred, we recommend that a guard should stay at the, at the door of, of the room to remind staff going in to, to wear their protective equipment and to take their names and record their name. Anyone going in should, should write his name on that logbook for the infection control office to, to know who went in, uh, this room, into this room. <clears throat> Anyone entering the room should at least wear the following PPE, personal protective equipment, gloves, uh, gown, the usual gown that we use, but it has to be fluid resistant. Okay. Eye protection, like these goggles, or a face shield, and a face mask. So you either use goggles or face shield, and you, you wear a regular mask. Surgical mask is enough. Okay. If you anticipate to have splashes of fluids from the patients, like you're planning to do intubation, or you, a nurse is planning to do suctioning in the intensive care unit, or you're planning to give a nebulized solution. Uh, anything that may lead to aerosolization of the virus should be dealt with under airborne precautions. So you should wear full PPE, including high filtration mask, high filtration mask, goggles, and it's better to cover your head, uh, wear a gown and lick covers. And you may put double gloves. So then you have to cover all the body if you anticipate to have a lot of fluids. For example, delivering a woman who, who is suspected Ebola, you may have amniotic fluids splashing into your body. Then you really have to full full aprons from head to toe. And you can wear it in this form, disposable uh, trousers with uh, shoe covers. Or you can use this one, the overall. Okay. All of this is disposable one. You can wear it with, with the face shield and the N95 mask uh, underneath. <clears throat> Upon exiting from the care area, it is very important that you remove the PPEs carefully. Very, very important. It's easy to put on the, the PPEs, but it's very dangerous to remove them without paying attention to where, you, where your hand is touching. Because if you dealt with an Ebola case and he coughed on your face, the virus now is sitting on the mask. You removed your gloves and then you took the mask from the front and you removed it this way. You contaminated your hands and you can get infected. So you should never do this. If, whenever you remove PPEs, you should really know how to remove the PPE. Never touch the front of the PPE. This is the principle. Never, never touch the front of the PPE. And remove the most contaminated one first. The most contaminated PPE would be the gloves. So you remove the gloves first. Then you remove the gown. Remove the gown from behind. Okay. Just roll it over without touching the outer side. And just from inside, hold it from inside and throw it in, in the garbage. Then you remove your mask, also untie it from behind. Don't do this. Untie it and, and 
throw it, holding it from the, its thread, okay, from the thread. And also the, the goggles, you should remove it from behind, don't remove it from the front, hold it from behind. And if it is, dis if it is not disposable, then you have to keep it in a special container to be disinfected. If there's a disposable face shield, just throw it away uh, right away. So this is how you should, uh, and I, I left some slides on how to do that. Uh, I don't have to go into details of this. Uh, it's always better to dedicate equipment to patients with, with Ebola. For scan, you should have his own stethoscope, his own blood pressure machine, etc. It's it's not recommended that you use your stethoscope for, uh, for for examining this patient. You should use only the patient's stethoscope. Okay. <coughs> you? Yeah. Uh, all non-dedicated, non-disposable medical equipment used for patient's care should be cleaned and disinfected according to the manufacturer's instructions and hospital policies. Uh, it's also recommended that you limit the use of needles, use, limit the use of needles and other sharps as much as possible. So minimize taking blood as much as possible. And you can use the needleless techniques. We have now new devices that have no needles to draw blood, etc. So try, or needles that are retract retractable. So try to use the uh, engineered devices to minimize needle, needle stick injuries. <clears throat> okay, this is, uh, as we said, when you're dealing with an airborne uh, uh, or aerosol generating procedures, you should wear an N95 mask, and this mask must be fit tested to make sure that it is well fitting your face, and when you wear it, you have to, to do a seal check to make sure that it is well applied onto your face. And we have different forms of the N95 mask, this, this, this shape and this one. All of them are acceptable, depending on which one fits you better, or fits you more. Now, very important thing that people tend to forget is that when you have a patient transferred, say, from the ER to the room on a, on a stretcher, or an, or an ambulance carrying a patient on, on this stretcher, or, or a bed, this bed and the, these, these surfaces will be heavily contaminated with the patient's secretions. So you really have to disinfect them between patients. So you cannot just vacate a stretcher and then put another one on, on, on it right away. You really have to disinfect it. And it's simple disinfection using hypochlorite or, or uh, lower bleach, house, household bleach. Uh, in terms of diagnosis, <coughs> uh, in the first few days, you can do ELISA to detect the antigen. You can do ELISA to detect IgM antibodies. And you can do PCR to detect the RNA of the virus. And you can do virus isolation. Later in the disease, you can only use IgM and IgG because the PCR and the antigen would be negative. Because the PCR and the antigen would be positive only during the viremia or the acute illness. But afterwards, only the IgM and the antibodies will help you in the diagnosis. Retrospectively, you can also, in, in a, say a disease, somebody who died and then you in retrospect suspect that he might have had Ebola, you can do immune histochemistry testing from uh, uh, tissue biopsy, and you can do PCR and, and virus isolation. The virus is a biosafety level 4 virus that has to be dealt with in, in, in special containment labs, which, which is known as biosafety level 4. This, this person, actually, as you can see, is wearing special suit with air pumped inside, P positive pressure, air suits. This is like a balloon. It's positive pressure inside to make sure that he doesn't inhale any, any viruses. And the, these are available in our lab as well, in King Abdelaziz, uh, by safety level 3 lab, and also in, in by safety level 4 labs in the CDC. And so th these people should be connected to air pump uh, when they are working. And you cannot really deal with, with specimens from Ebola patients in a regular lab. However, there, there are some issues, practical issues, in terms of the routine blood tests like the CBC, the UNDE, where should we do them? And we can discuss this maybe in the discussion. <clears throat> in terms of treatment, there's no specific vaccine or medicines to treat uh, uh, Ebola. 
uh, you only need to give or to provide supportive care uh, with intravenous fluids, balancing the electrolytes, and maintaining the oxygen status or, and the blood pressure, etc. Uh, there are several experimental medications. One of them is the so-called ZMAP, uh, which is uh, antibodies developed in mice uh, against Ebola virus and was tried in two American uh, uh, patients who got infected in Liberia and they both of them survived. There is a big promise uh, that this uh, medication w would, would work. And now uh, we, we met, I met with the WHO experts uh, last week to discuss the ethical uh, aspect of using experimental medications in the setting of an Ebola outbreak. And everybody was agreeable that uh, if, if the safety profile is believed to be acceptable, we should go ahead and, and use it as a treatment uh, if we have enough supply uh, in Africa or wherever. So now the company is trying to manufacture this ZMAP quickly, and we may have it as an available resource to treat patients with suspected Ebola. <clears throat> so this is basically what I wanted to say about Ebola. And uh, in terms of the uh, other viruses like al Khumra and Dengue, uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Questions? In 1998, first time, by the Japanese uh, government for influenza, the same medication. My uh, my thought was, if this can be used for influenza, why can't we use Tamiflu at the same time? Uh, because they used for flu all these years, Japanese. We can use Tamiflu also at the same like a uh, treatment for even for. Ebola because we are not losing anything at least we can prevent flu and the other question was from the, my previous uh, speaker he was uh, saying that the questionnaires are given to those people traveling to this country Saudi Arabia they are if they manage somehow to come to this country is there any screening program available at the airport so that we can screen them isolate them give them some prophylactic, tre prophylactic treatment and ZMAP is, uh, I think they are going to manufacture at least 20,000 20, doses will be available pretty soon. That's what I came to know. And the CDC is also manufacturing uh, experimental vaccines. I think that's also going to be available. That's all my knowledge is. Thank you very much. Thank you for the questions. In terms of uh, using uh, uh, Tamiflu or Ozenitamavir to treat Ebola, uh, antibodies, then they use these antibodies to neutralize the virus when people get infected. So this is not antibiotic, it's just antibiotic. Yeah. No, no, I mean it's not an antimicrobial, it's, 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 uh, it's antibodies, yes. The uh, your other question is, we actually we stopped issuing visas for uh, people in the epidemic countries, Sierra Leone, Gab uh, Liberia, and Guinea, for a very long time. So we are not expected to have people coming from them. However, people may travel to these countries and then come to us. Say a, a British man may go to Sierra Leone and then come to us. So what we've done is that we've designed a card that should be distributed to all passengers landing in uh, the main airports. To, to fill in and say if they have been to any of the endemic countries over the past three weeks or not. If they have been to any of these three countries over the past three weeks, then they would be screened in the airport, examined, checked. If they are asymptomatic, they will still follow them up to 21 days while staying in the hospital, while staying in, in, in the country, be it in Hajj or well, in, in, in the hotel or wherever. They will be contacted on a daily basis to make sure that they haven't developed Ebola symptoms. Uh, so this is what we're doing. Uh, Prof. Tariq, can we take one question before the break? Because we have to come back here around 3. It's 2.30 already. Dr. Iman Ashgar, she has a question. We'll stop after 10 minutes and we'll return again uh, for the two practical uh, presentations. And after that, we'll take more questions if you want to. Thank you, Dr. Tariq. Thank you, Dr. Tariq. 
uh, I'm the head of the ICU in Mina Tawari, which as far as I know, it will be the control area during Hajj. Regarding these patients, do we need to change the ventilators from one patient to other accepted or one ventilator for a patient not to be taken to the other? The ventilators, not the, not the circle, the empty tube and the other. Ventilator has to be one for a patient or it can be used for the second no, one? No. No. You just do the routine disinfection, standard disinfection of ventilators between patients. So whatever you do between patients who are in, on ventilators before you use the ventilator, you do the same with, with an Ebola case. You don't have to dedicate, I mean, special ventilator to them. You just do routine disinfection. If you disinfect any machine, you can use it, provided you disinfect it properly. Now you can use a dialysis machine, can use uh, ventilator machines, blood pressure machine, anything, but it has to be properly disinfected. Dr. Tarek, there are many questions that are present here. The doctor asks if there is a low temperature of the virus, if it is possible to die in the high temperature or not. And the second question is if there is a low temperature of the virus, is it possible to die in the high temperature? Yes, the virus is not actually very difficult to, co to control or eradicate. The routine standard disinfection with, with the household bleach that we commonly use is, is enough to disinfect. So it's, it's not a, a hardy virus. It, it can be easily uh, disinfected with, with the routine disinfectants. And this is why we don't recommend any special disinfectants for the Ebola, just the routine uh, skin disinfectant. In terms of the temperature, I'm, I'm, I'm not aware of, of the uh, uh, temperature that this virus is inactivated in. Uh, taking all the precautions in packaging yet. Yeah. Any microbiology uh, specialist or consultant will know how to package the, the specimens uh, for transportation. So you have to put the tube uh, in a bag with, with tissue around and then put it in another bag we put it then in a box, and this box has to have special qualities, etc. So we do have guidelines on this, and I think uh, I don't see any of our lab uh, personnel around but from, I mean, the Ministry of Health. Uh, I think this uh, this is already posted in the Ministry of Health website. The guidelines from from our platform. Dr. Asam Azhar, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Qutb, and uh, Steve. Uh, I forgot his last name, Steve, uh, Steven, jo uh, John Steven. Uh, are the people in the, in the lab platform uh, putting these guidelines after uh, being revised by the, the scientific advisory board? I, I, I lead, just for you to know, I, I, I'm the chairman of the scientific advisory board, the medical advisory board, which reports directly to the Ministry of Health. And in, in this group, we have lab platform, we have epidemiologists, we have uh, emergency physicians, intensivists. And infectious disease, and the same, and also veterinary virologists like Prof. Taibo Zain. So we, we do address all these issues, and then approve the guidelines and put them on the website for people to be guided. That's it. Uh, my name is Hani Jukdar. I'm the uh, chief medical officer for uh, King Fahad Hospital Jeddah. Uh, I'll speak from the background of uh, the experience which we had with the uh, the. Uh, first suspect case which was uh, uh, pushed to our hospital here um, and I'll give you how did we de how, how did we handle that case during that uh, period uh, first of all I'll talk about some um, uh, important points that we need to keep in mind the first uh, that uh, there are three theories and three facts which I wanted to mention that uh, and everybody need to be aware of that we are exposed like any other country in the world to have case of Ebola, uh, despite visa restrictions, which was mentioned earlier by Dr. Anis, that three countries have uh, uh, are not allowed to apply for visa this year, which are Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, and uh, the third one is Liberia. Uh, despite that restriction, we are uh, a very high traffic country, especially during this season, and we have a higher risk during uh, this, uh, this month and the month after. Uh, we need to get well prepared, uh, are we? We need to ask ourselves this question all the time. Are we really well prepared or not? Then uh, uh, 
the fact that Ebola is one of the viral hemorrhagic fevers that transmitted uh, that transmits through contacts with blood and body fluid, as uh, comprehensively been described by Dr. Tarek, and um, contacts and droplet isolation for all patients, as uh, well as mentioned by Prof. Tarek earlier on. If uh, aerosol generated procedures are going to take place, like intubation or uh, 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 ventilation, uh, ventilating the patient or putting the patient under suctioning machine, we need to make sure that airborne uh, isolation precaution is implemented as well. Um, uh, we have a few quick questions, a few quick actions that we need to have. Uh, very important to be in our uh, in our booklet or in our uh, pocket all the time. Case definition need to be there, need to be applied, need to be reviewed by the medical staff who are dealing with the patient at the front line, like the emergency doctors, the internal medicine doctors, uh, the residents particularly. Uh, immediately, we need to think of isolating the patient. The very important uh, uh, quick action is to isolate the patient immediately. Uh, staff contact the patient should be immediately identified whenever you have a suspect case that is applying the case definition of a suspect case or probable case, you need to immediately uh, get a list and identify those people who were in contact with the patient uh, and to do proper disinfection uh, at that point. Uh, and also we need to do infection, the infection control should be communicated immediately. So if I'm a resident in the emergency room and I'm seeing a patient and uh, after the, the five or 10 minutes of the history taking, I start to put some question mark on my head about viral hemorrhagic fever, query Ebola. One of the very important things is fever and history of travel to one of those three countries within the incubation period, similar to the case that we had. Or uh, somebody with a contact of a sick patient who has, who has been known to be a case of uh, viral hemorrhagic fever or a history of travel and died because of fever. Uh, so we need to put that in mind, so all junior doctors should keep in mind these definitions. And at that situation, immediately, he should do the, follow the, the, the points I mentioned uh, in this uh, slide. Uh, once the infection control department get contacted, they have an immediate role to do. Uh, the immediate role is to reconfirm the case definition. So that they should go and track the case definition as uh, dedicated to us. We don't want to create our, our own case definition. We are awaiting uh, Professor Tariq Madani and the scientific committee, uh, the case definition, the, the final case definition. There is a draft we, which we have received early on, but there should be a uh, uh, final ca reviewed case definition which will be delivered to us pretty soon. So we need, it's on the website already, so the infection control team to need to reconfirm that the case definition uh, has been achieved on that particular patient from the medical resident is appropriate. Uh, once they do, they need to inform the chief medical officer or the hospital director at that level because we need to have an escalation mood should go there. Um, identify and review all infection control standards that should be applied for such an isolation. So the infection control should immediately go, put a, put a list, uh, write down all the infection control standards and precautions should be uh, applied for that patient. Create a checklist, immediate checklist. Uh, staff contacted the patient must be kept to be self-isolated. Remember the, uh, the discussion that Prof. Tariq mentioned that we don't isolate the case a home self-isolation, uh, or uh, Anis Sindhi actually, Dr. Anis said it. But here we don't isolate, we don't do self-isolation for cases. We do self-isolation for contacts who has contacted the patient before the, uh, the case definition uh, applied properly. Uh, until we do that uh, self-isolation uh, until the case confirmation or rule out. Uh, any missing material uh, must be immediately flagged to, the pro to be provided through the regional directorate immediately or to mobilize the patient out of the facility. So once the, the infection control uh, put uh, the checklist for herself or himself, they need to go through the checklist. If there is anything that is missing in the hospital, they should flag it immediately to the hospital directorate, which will raise it to the, uh, to the uh, regional directorate in the country or in the, in the city where they are, and they must be supplied. If not, then the infection control 
must stand up and say, sorry, we cannot handle this case. Some other hospital should take care of that. So do not play the, uh, the hero and take a case where, where your facility cannot handle. Your facility must be capable to handle that case. And um, alhamdulillah, we were able to flag three hospitals nationwide, one in Jeddah, one in Riyadh, and one in uh, the eastern province. And each of these hospitals supposedly well uh, equipped to take those cases. And in the western strap of the country, it's us. It's King Fahad Hospital Jeddah. Uh, material required, uh, full suit cover, uh, the head to toe, we have it. Uh, when we received the case, we reviewed our stocks from the mers -CoV. We had them. So there, was, there were available head to, head to, uh, uh, head to toe uh, coverage was available in the hospital. And we called for, uh, for that uh, supply from the, uh, from the local store or the substore in the hospital and were delivered immediately. Face shields were also available, respiratory hood. Uh, we had uh, five of them, and we get another supply of another four. So we, had, during that case management, we had uh, um, nine uh, respiratory hood available in the hospital within the vicinity of that reception area. N95 masks uh, must be available and uh, supplied, surgical masks, yellow gowns, shoe cover, and gloves. So these are the, the core material that you need to have in your hand uh, available to you uh, to say, yes, I will handle that case. That is basic. Plus other areas, which is the facility itself. As Prof. Tariq mentioned, there should be available single dedicated room with its own bath, toilet inside it, and uh, proper waste, uh, proper uh, negative pressure room when, whenever needed, or HEPA filter portable one whenever needed. Uh, once the infection control would say, yes, we have this material available, then the CMO should have an objective. Uh, control, uh, the CMO or the hospital director should have four objectives that he needs to fulfill to make sure that he can deliver the appropriate management without a chain of infection inside the, inside the hospital for healthcare workers or uh, other patients. Uh, number one, control of any further transmission to your people or your other patients. So your main thing is to protect your own staff. Before, before, before thinking of managing the existing patient you have is how to protect your own staff. That is number one. And inside it, protect the other patients who are coming for another service. You don't want them to end up having Ebola in the hospital. So that is your, your, your first and very important tool before receiving the first patient. You need to describe the organism very well, make sure how that organism transmits, how that organism gets infected that patient, and what are the consequences. Uh, and you need to make sure that very detailed epidemiological history is taken. So the epidemiological history is very important because you need to go and track the patients who were in contact with the patient since he or she developed the symptoms. And we had that in our case. Actually, there was uh, uh, three children, a wife, a nephew, and uh, a couple of uh, wa wife's relatives, and uh, two uh, uh, brother-in-laws. So nine family members were close, were in contact with that patient since his illness. Plus, the healthcare worker who took care of that patient when he was uh, moving between hospitals. So the epidemiological, the epidemiological history is very important in such a case. Uh, number three, assessment of your own infection control preventive and uh, uncontrolled measure. You need to make sure that you continuously, uh, throughout the period of handling that case, you need to have continuous assessment. Because uh, the infection control is a system, yes, but it, is, uh, it depends on human. And human can do mistakes. So there should be someone who is doing the practice and someone auditing that practice continuously. Assessment of your surveillance system. During the process also, you need to do surveillance. So, uh, Prof. Tariq mentioned that you need to have a lookbook of patients, of healthcare workers who go in and out for, for, uh, uh, during, the take, during the taking care of that patient. We did that, and what we do, we need to continue to do surveillance for those staff for fever or uh, other symptoms 
throughout the incubation period. Um, uh, the, the, the CMO also has an immediate role, and he has uh, a longer term role. The immediate role, sorry, uh, is to gather the team that is going to be handling the case, i.e., the treating doctor or doctors, nursing director, lab director, radiology director, support service director, infection control director, and public health at the directorate level. And this team will review the action plans and strategize for more cases and control measures. Uh, what we did is, exa uh, luckily, when we had the, the case, the, uh, the case wasn't in our hospital, it was in some other hospital, and they asked us to take the case. We, uh, we asked for six hour uh, uh, grace period for us to, to review ourselves. Are we ready or we are, not, or we are not ready? If we are not ready, what we need to do to be ready? And that six hours helped us uh, to, uh, to deliver the service in the right way and the right direction. And we did that. We gathered the team, we sat down together, we reviewed, everybody created his own checklist of what he wanted to do, and we, from there, we went on. Uh, notify public health director at uh, uh, level, uh, and uh, when we visited part of our uh, uh, preparation, we visited the other hospital where the patient was in, and uh, we found the public health um, uh, officers were sitting there reviewing the uh, public health issues in the uh, uh, in the vicinity of the hospital. Uh, we need to review the hospitals. The longer term is to, re is to review the hospital PSO, which is people, system, and organization. It's very important because it's not only people, it's not only system, it's not only the organizational structure, it's a, co it's a collective uh, model. You cannot rely on one of them. For the people, uh, the CMO has to ask himself, do I have the appropriate and qualified staff to deal with the case or no? If I don't have the qualified staff, do not go and play the hero role. Please, just make sure. It's not a joke. It's something very critical, something that could uh, uh, devastate a country. Okay? So what we need to do, do not take a hero role. Just sit down with yourself, ask, your, ask your, yourself a very straight question. Do I have the qualified and the appropriate people to do so or not. Uh, think of the internal medicine, think of the intensive care, uh, think of the uh, uh, CPR team, think, think of the infection control team, uh, the nurses, and the housekeeper. These are the five or the six critical people who will uh, immediately take care of the patient during his stay in the hospital. If you don't have those people available in your hospital uh, and closely monitored by you, do not uh, take the case. Say, I'm sorry. Uh, keep a close eye on the people involved. Even if you have the right people, you need to watch them. Keep your eyes wide open. What we did, we put a camera uh, in our uh, hospital here at the door of the room. And, and I could see that door from my office and the head nurse keep watching the monitor and the uh, nursing station all the time, so people are watching. You, you give that sense to the people, somebody's watching me, it's, uh, it, it's going to help. Review with the infection control and the nursing director the process to identify all people entering and leaving the patient care area. So the nursing director should create that for you. What she came uh, back to us with, she said, I want to create a logbook, sign in, sign out. And there was a book, sign in, sign out sheet. Nobody is allowed inside the room without signing in, and nobody leaving the room without signing, uh, signing out. That was very important. Why? Because if there is a break or breach in the infection control, we will know who we will get, and we will know who will survey uh, in case of uh, confirmed case and more cases coming out. Uh, at the organization level, we need to have a single isolation room, as what Prof. Tariq Madani says earlier. Uh, uh, we need to have a single isolation room in the ICU as well. So it's not only in the ward, because those patients usually get deteriorated, and uh, they might need uh, ventilator, need to be intubated and ventilated, which was exactly what happened to our patient. Uh, and we need to have a negative pressure room in the ICU, 
because of the possible aerosol generated procedure either during intubation or CPR. And uh, uh, you need to have a proper waste storage. There should be a proper a place for waste management and storage because waste is a very high risk, uh, a very high risk uh, point of infection, of transmission of infection. And uh, not to forget the morgue. Uh, actually, once we had the patient, uh, we thought of the morgue. What if this patient dies? What are we going to do? So always keep in mind that the morgue is ready. Uh, somebody can take care of the dead body there because you will not allow that body to be uh, washed uh, outside the morgue. You need to seal the body in the, uh, uh, in the bag yourself. Make sure it's controllable at the hospital before it goes out. Uh, the role of the CMO later on is to take a decision either to keep the patient or to discharge him based on the assessment of the PSO that I mentioned earlier. Uh, communicate the decision to the public health support with justification. If you will tell the public health, I will take the patient, then you have to give clarification. Why am I taking the patient? I'm ready for this. I'm ready for that. And I can do this and that. I need that support from you. Uh, in, in, um, uh, to, in order to take care of the patient properly. If you're not going to take the case, you tell them your clear justification. They might help you to sort it out. Or they might tell you, yes, you are right. I will not risk you. I will take the patient somewhere else. Uh, and enforce the support of the infection control team to implement all the precautions. In such a, in such a condition, which we had it actually in the mers -CoV, if you remember in, uh, in Ramadan, uh, not Ramadan, even before in Shaban, we said that anybody who breaks the, or breaches the infection control practice will be disciplined. We put, we we move from advice and instruct and train to disciplinary action. And similarly here, you need to enforce the infection control. Tell the infection control team if you see somebody breaching, stop him from working immediately. And tell somebody. Uh, go and sort out the, the disciplinary action itself. Uh, if we cannot take the case, then I, if, I, if I would uh, decide, no, I'm not taking the case, then I have to communicate the message to the public health. I shouldn't just discharge the patient. There are, unfortunately, there are some health care institutes uh, have some irresponsible attitudes. And uh, in, we saw it in the mers -CoV, some hospitals, they receive patients with people and cough, and the minute they suspect MERS-CoV, they discharge the patient. They tell the patient, go to King Fahad Hospital, or go to X Hospital, or Y Hospital. Without properly securing the patient's movement in the society before he comes to our hospital. Please, uh, everybody who is listening to this uh, presentation, do not do that. Uh, you need to make sure that if you have a case, a suspect case, and you cannot handle, it's no shame. Just tell the public health, I cannot do it, and I need you to, go, to come and take this patient from my hospital to somewhere else where they can take care of him. Uh, you need to keep the patient under isolation until somebody come and take him from you. Even if you cannot give him care, do not give him care. Keep him isolated until public health come and take that, that patient from you. And that happened to us, actually, in the suspect, the second, not the suspect, the contact of the first case. The other hospital, they called us, they said, come and take the case. We told them, keep him under isolation. Nobody touch him until we go and take him ourselves. And we did that. Uh, uh, arrange for safe uh, care provision by healthcare worker to the patient. Meanwhile, the hospital and upon discharge, uh, if not available, ask the public health. As I said, if you cannot take care of the patient, just refrain from taking care of him, but keep him under isolation until somebody and take care of him or her. Uh, uh, again, we have more uh, points here. Infection control needs to train candidates and appoint them to police and control all traffic uh, in the patient room, making sure that everybody is abiding with the PPE. And make sure that the people who do not have anything to do with the patient must not go into the room, whatever it takes, even the family member. Yeah, unless uh, a baby that we need to be taken care of by a mother or a father. Uh, if blood sample was collected, then it needs to be recalled. 
So if some if blood sample uh, was taken by the nurse or the doctor, and after that you started to have the case definition uh, query, and uh, the blood sample that you sent to the lab, call the lab. If not process, recall it back in a secured box. If not, I was mentioning here that uh, you need to do lab, dis lab disinfection. Uh, I was expecting Dr. Professor uh, Azhar to present, but he apologized, I think, in the last minute, or, or public health, they took uh, their presentation. We need to do something with the lab. Uh, I, I believe that Prof. Uh, Assam Azhar has something, and uh, it is in the website of the Ministry of Health, how to disinfect the lab after the sample was handled and discovered later on to be a risk of a VHF. Uh, and as Prof. Tariq Madani also mentioned earlier, uh, in, in the law says that if you have a suspect case of uh, Ebola, do not uh, handle the lab in your own lab. So if you collect, if you collect uh, the blood uh, sample, somebody should take care of it with the proper and safe and secure transportation. Uh, prepare for the transfer as if, you are, as if your ambulance will do it. Um, so just do not rely on somebody's ambulance to take the care of the patient or to transfer him. Prepare it as if you are doing it yourself. Minimum staff and minimum equipment should be in the ambulance. Do not staff. Uh, make sure that all the uh, equipment or the staff who might be involved with the ambulance transfer, if they are not necessarily, necessarily essential, take them out. Driver doesn't have to put the PPE like the, the uh, healthcare worker. The healthcare worker should wear from head to toe. The driver, surgical mask is enough, but he should not uh, interfere with any uh, uh, patient manipulation. Um, I will take you through our journey in King Fahad Hospital. Uh, for a couple of cases. Uh, the first case was a suspect uh, case of VHF, and the second case was a contact for the, for the, first, for the first case who had headache. Uh, I will not go through the second case because of the time. I will just take the first one. Uh, what we did, uh, actually, we were notified by the Ministry of Health. Uh, we evaluated the risk of probability. Uh, we clarify if it was a, dire a direction or a choice. Dr. Anis called me at 2 p.m. said, Hani, we have uh, a case of query Ebola. Uh, I just get frozen for a few seconds. Then I said, yes. Uh, he said, can you take it? I asked him, is it a direction or a choice? He said, listen, you can take it with, well, uh, either a choice now, but later on it might be a direction if nobody can handle it. So they give me a few minutes, I'll come back to you. I took myself with my myself a few minutes just to understand, to absorb the shock. Then I called them back. I said, yes, we just had the MERS-CoV. We know how to control uh, the people and the system. Yes, but give me six hours uh, in which I will get my, myself ready. Uh, so we replied with a decision. So you must reply with a decision. Do not just uh, keep calm and stay away. Um, do the internal review, as I mentioned earlier. Bring your team sit down with them, uh, approve the transfer, uh, communicate back to the Ministry of Health whenever uh, you want to take the patient, uh, send, uh, spend time uh, at the transferring hospital, which we did. We went there, we reviewed with them what they have done. We told them that we don't want to have a contact with the patient or the patient's environment uh, unless he is in his room in my hospital. So the patient came to our hospital, taken out of the ambulance by their staff. We gave their staff PPE. We escorted them to the elevator. They took the patient to his room. And inside the room, our staff went there. They, they endorsed the case. So zero contact uh, with the patient until he is in his, inside his room. Uh, then, uh, with the internal preparation, as I said earlier, the treating doctor and his residents should be aware, the lab technician, housekeeper, and nursing, uh, action, uh, surveillance camera, as I told you earlier, sign in and, sign out, out, sign in and out uh, logbook, uh, the nurse assigned to the patient uh, is the owner. We told her nobody is the owner of this room. 
It's not the doctor, it's not me, it's not the infection control, it's you. So the nurse is the boss. She is the one who allows people in or out. Because she is the one who's sitting inside the room all the time. So she is the boss for that room, it's not me. If I want to go there without wearing my PPE, you kick me out of the room. It was very clear instruction to her. I think she is with us here. Is not? Okay. Uh, the transfer process, as I said, we agreed with the hospital, the transferring hospital, that we will not get in contact with the patient until he's in his room. And then um, after the patient arrived, uh, we reconciled again. The whole team, which was in the beginning, preparing, sat down, reconciled what we have done. Go through it again, together. Instead of everyone do it alone, we sat together, we reviewed everything. And uh, uh, during the reconciliation, we found out what if the patient arrested. The patient in the beginning was not very sick. He was sick, but not uh, intubated, not in an ICU, in a regular room, just feverish. And when he arrived at our hospital, uh, our intensivist said, what if this patient get deteriorated and arrested? So part of the reconcilement, we sat down, we reviewed the CPR process. So it's a good to reconcile because you will come up with things that might surprise you later on. This is our PPE. Actually, we had the full, P the full uh, suit from head to toe, but our nurse was very worried. She wear everything. Uh, that is, uh, uh, she has the overall suit, which appears here in the, if you look at the hood, this is the hood covering her hair. She has the face shield, and she has the uh, ventilator hood. This is the, the white one. You can see it with the arrow here. And she wears the, uh, the, the, the suit uh, covering the foot and the, and the hood as well. On top of that, she wears the OR uh, water-resistant gown. And on top of that, the yellow apron. Uh, uh, it was over protection, the first case. And uh, I said, I told her, just protect yourself as much as you want. Because I want her to feel secure and, uh, and comfortable. And this is during the CP, during the recitation, actually. Uh, if you see, the doctor was there. He also was wearing everything with the hood. Uh, and he's wearing the N95 mask, and only three people were allowed in during the CPR. We, we cut down the number. Uh, my staff has a priority here, the situation. We cut down the number of the people who will do the CPR to three. Uh, but we rehearsed that beforehand. So they said, we rehearsed to, uh, to make sure how many people can do it. And with the rehearsal, they discovered that three people can cover it in that situation. The burial, we also created a checklist. Once the patient died, we reconciled again. We sat down again together. What we want to do? We created a checklist. Uh, Dr. Arij, our patient control, Dr. Garut, they sat down with the morgue uh, uh, manager, uh, Mr. Hassan uh, Zahrani. Uh, they sat down together. They created a checklist. And they moved the checklist. Uh, the, the, the next day, we found out that the checklist was available in the CDC. So it is the downside that sometimes you think you can do it yourself, not reviewing a checklist. Uh, luckily, alhamdulillah, this checklist which we have created was exactly similar to the checklist which was available in the uh, CDC. Uh, because we have the experts, we have Dr. Garut and Dr. Arij, they are infection control background. So they created the list uh, pretty much uh, the same. Uh, and we also, in the list, we put who's responsible. Is it King Fahad? Is it the municipality? Or is it the graveyard? So in every single area, we put a responsibility. One of the very important things, uh, it is in the checklist. For those who want to go through it, you can read it. I don't want to, because time, I'm taking from Dr. Uh, uh, Khaled time. Uh, the checklist, part of it is the family. It's very important. What we did, uh, the minute that the patient died, I grabbed the phone, I called the brother, the next of kin, told him I need family. Actually, in the day of admission, we called for family, family, family consult. We brought the family, we sat down with them, uh, Dr. Mohammed Chalabi, Dr. Wael Tashkandi from the CCC, myself and Dr. Garut. We sat down with the family, we explained to them what exactly he has and what is the possible outcome. And at that time, he was already in the very steep deterioration. So they were aware. Uh, the next day when the patient passed away, immediately I called the, 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 the next of Ken brother, I called him uh, on the phone, I, I, I broke the news to him, 
and I ask him before you think of visiting him or seeing him or taking him, I need you with two other family members close to him in my office because we want to sit down together. They came and I told them the whole thing about the infectious disease, that you will not be able to see him or wash him or bury him yourself. Somebody will take care of that and he will bury, he'll be buried in a bag. They were very much accepting because, uh, because uh, we communicated with them. So it's very important that you communicate with the people with, with, uh, with uh, uh, empathy. So do not ignore that. It is very important. Uh, they were very receptive, alhamdulillah. Things went smooth. Uh, he died, Allah arhamu, uh, the next morning. Uh, one take-home message for me uh, after that case. Communication is very important. Preparation is very important. Rehearsal. Policing. Never forget policing. People, if you don't police them, they don't follow. And documentation. Document everything. Just document everything. Because your, document, your documentation will be learning in the future. We documented this, and I'm using it now, the real-time experience of uh, our first case. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have questions, we will leave it uh, later on after Dr. Bawakid's presentation. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, I will uh, talk about the public health role uh, in uh, 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 infectious disease. Uh, first, let me uh, just give you uh, a two or three slides on uh, what is public health. Maybe some people uh, do not have an idea about uh, public health. Uh, public health um, is one of the MOH sector which uh, uh, deal with uh, measures that uh, prevent uh, disease, uh, promote health, and uh, prolong life uh, among the uh, population as a whole. Uh, from uh, this model, you can see that uh, we have uh, two models, the medical model and the public health model. Uh, what I want to say from this slide is that uh, we work as a team. Uh, the medical model, uh, what I mean by the, the hospitals, they mainly uh, uh, follow the patients, uh, make sure that their community inside the hospital are safe, following uh, strictly all the guidelines for uh, the infection control measures, and they are well protected. Uh, public health model, uh, they uh, make sure that the community are uh, safe uh, and well uh, protected from getting, uh, getting infections or from uh, spreading the infection to the uh, community. So we are uh, completing each uh, other. Uh, public health professional uh, mainly monitor, diagnose, and uh, promote health. And uh, the prevent epidemics, uh, protect against uh, environmental uh, hazards, and respond to disasters and assist uh, communities in recovery. Uh, we do prevent uh, injuries, we promote uh, health behaviors, and assure the quality and accessibility of health services. Uh, surveillance. Surveillance is one of the major uh, functions of uh, public health, especially in um, uh, infectious disease and uh, outbreaks, uh, where it's an ongoing uh, systematic uh, collection of, uh, of data, um, analysis, uh, interpretation of data, and um, uh, um, disseminate this data with the other um, um, uh, authorities that uh, need to, 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 be, to take uh, early action. Uh, while survey is one uh, data collection. So the major function is uh, surveillance, which we continuously collect data, analyze, and do the necessary uh, media. Uh, the goals of uh, surveillance in uh, uh, infectious disease is mainly to uh, detect outbreaks, epidemics, uh, estimate uh, the magnitude, mainly the mortality, morbidity of a disease, um, help to facilitate planning uh, for um, what the next action to be taking for uh, such um, an epidemic or outbreak uh, in infectious disease and stimulate the uh, research uh, to uh, make sure what are the um, outcome, what are the risk factors so to prevent uh, other uh, epidemics later on. Uh, notification is one uh, major part of um, uh, surveillance where uh, the process of um, early informing uh, about uh, the case or a suspect. Uh, it's a basic element of uh, uh, surveillance. It is a cornerstone in the control and uh, prevention of infectious disease. 
uh, the Ministry of Health has um, defined all the um, communicable diseases into two uh, parts. Uh, they call it Section 1 and 2, or a double O or uh, Section 1 is a um, highly infectious disease where it has to be notified early in less than 24 hours to the higher authority. And this is um, uh, like cholera plagues and uh, yellow fever, uh, rubella, mums, and uh, of course, uh, hemorrhagic fever is. Uh, uh, one of it, uh, one of this uh, uh, highly infectious disease where it has to be notified early in less than uh, 24 hours to the higher authority in um, MOH and uh, section 2 which is um, those uh, who can be uh, has to be notified um, within the within less than one week to uh, public health and um, uh, a report has to be uh, raised uh, monthly to uh, Minister of Health like uh, hepatitis and all types, uh, tetanus, typhoid, and uh, a suspected um, a case notification form. And we have a form for lab request. And the third form, which is for uh, the epidemiological investigation. All forms must be completed and uh, must be uh, notified to MOH. Uh, this form, just to give you the uh, show you, and you can see find this form in, uh, in your infection control department uh, in each hospital. Uh, this is the first uh, request form and this is the epidemiological where we use it to uh, know all the epidemiological data about uh, the patients, his history, his uh, clinical um, history, his uh, travel history and, and, and uh, other related uh, uh, history or data. For contacts, um, uh, this is one of the major rules for public health that we have. We do follow the contacts, especially the household, the healthcare worker, um, air plan, plan if needed uh, contacts. The contact must be must be followed for 21 days for Ebola, uh, as we have uh, previously done with the suspected case. And uh, we did uh, we did follow all this uh, the case the contacts we had um, about 48. Uh, um, contact at uh, the, how, uh, the house of uh, the suspected case, Allah Yerhamu, uh, uh, Zahrani. And we do follow these cases um, daily, in a daily basis, uh, to make sure that they do not develop any symptoms uh, related to um, hemorrhagic uh, fever. And if anyone uh, develops, then we have to notify and send back, um, transfer to the hospital. Alhamdulillah, all were uh, well and no one developed any symptoms. Uh, if any symptom develops, then uh, uh, develop to any of the contacts, uh, then they has to uh, be in a suspected case and has to be uh, moved to the hospital. Uh, the precautions was taken by MOH again. This is a, a slide was uh, I think um, you hear today that stop issuing visa uh, from these countries, um, temporary stopping Saudis from traveling to these countries, and finally. Uh, issue a new uh, memo that MOH uh, um, uh, Minister of Foreign that any people who travel to this country even they did they had the visa from other country they should be asked about this uh, issue uh, again applying the Ebola card has been mentioned by uh, Prof. Tariq and we have if we have a suspected case at the airport or the entry we have to um, uh, follow them for 21 days uh, to make sure that they do not have any symptoms uh, to protect our community. Uh, this is the last slide. This is the, the memo uh, by the Minister of Health, uh, which show uh, this has been distributed to all um, hospitals uh, in all regions and uh, show um, the case definitions and um, what are the surveillance and what are the um, protocols to be taking. And you can download all these guidelines from the Minister of Health uh, website. Uh, thank you. So, uh, uh, we're still searching for, no, no, we're still searching for, uh, for other possible causes, such as uh, other vir viruses or uh, is, 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 is the organisms. But uh, the good thing about this patient is that all of his contacts who, who did have contact with him, 
pass the incubation period without any problems. So we, we're okay. I have two questions. One about the structure of the virus. It has uh, interferon stopping gene, like uh, mass corona. That means that the patient is unable to, to raise the normal immunological response to viruses. And also, in addition, that Ebola have uh, uh, corticosteroid or adrenal uh, tissue, uh, adrenal cortex uh, necrotizing uh, character, uh, character. That means that the patient also needs corticosteroids early on in the disease, in addition to the uh, interferon. I don't know if that interferes the treatment, uh, affect the treatment uh, options. And the second question, do we have a preventive things like uh, if you go to UK, you need, uh, there is regulation in the airline that they need to spray mosquitoes and this. Do we do the same for any airplane or uh, ship that arrive from all parts of the world and especially Africa against ticks and mosquitoes or we don't have this regulation till now? Okay, as regards the uh, treatment, uh, I'm not aware of any treatment options uh, for Ebola that is uh, like interferon nor uh, steroids uh, recommended for, uh, for Ebola. Uh, and I'm not aware of this uh, background that the, the, it leads to necrosis of the adrenal gland. And I haven't heard that this is recommended. Uh, so we don't, in general, we don't recommend it because steroids may, may suppress the immune system further and uh, may also lead to bleeding, particularly gastritis. And so I, I personally don't recommend uh, the use of steroids at all. And uh, as regards the, uh, the planes, spraying the insecticides and planes, planes coming from Africa is routinely done uh, to prevent uh, yellow fever uh, introduction. Uh, because mosquitoes in Africa may, may carry the virus. Uh, and we, we, we also do that for planes from dengue, uh, from uh, dengue endemic areas in Australia. When they travel to, say, outside, they can export dengue in, in plane. So this is a routine uh, measure that is done now by most uh, airplanes or, or uh, airlines to, to prevent spread of uh, mosquito-borne infections. The ticks are not killed by uh, insecticides. So you don't really, and ticks don't usually travel easily with, with planes. With, with animals, yes, they may travel, with them, yes. but not, not on planes. Uh, for, uh, just to comment on the control of the uh, ticks on animals imported into the different parts of the world. Usually they have what they call dips, the IPS. <coughs> These dips, they contain uh, archaecytes. These archaecytes are specific for ticks. And you, you dip the animal, uh, the whole animal is dipped on these uh, bases, and then they go into the country, or where they quarantine, or the, um, the points for control of these ticks. And then after that, they are released into the uh, country. These leaves are very important, and they are very effective. They have been used in most parts of the world. And usually, you introduce the animal after you give him a good uh, dose of watering. He has to drink, because otherwise, he will drink the insecticide itself. So this is one of the technicalities in the control. Yes, they do this. Yes. It is practiced here. Well, uh, so I mean, you really have to. Well, uh, 
I wasn't involved in this decision. But we do have a big problem, a big problem with TB, at least in the university hospital, where, where we've really taken the biggest load of TB in, in maybe in Jeddah, in, in our isolation unit. So uh, my recommendation is that uh, if you have a patient who is still positive, smear positive after two weeks, there could be these positive smears could represent dead bacilli in a clinic in somebody who's clinically improving. But it may also be due to a viable and sensitive bacilli in somebody who has extensive pulmonary TB who may continue to shed the bacilli despite clinical improvement. Such patients would say if you have somebody with extensive TB, bilateral cavity pulmonary TB, and the patient is responding, but he's still shedding viable bacilli. Viable bacilli. So the third option, so you have dead bacilli, a viable bacilli in somebody who is clinically improving, or you may have resistant TB, or you may have colonization with, with atypical microbacteria on top of his or TB, if, and this may happen in somebody with, say, bronchitis. So you have different, uh, several possibilities. So the clinician should be able to differentiate between them uh, based on the clinical response and the, the X-ray findings uh, and the positivity of, of the smear and then come up with, with, with a decision. In general, in, 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 for example, in the university where, where I'm, I'm the consultant, I can make this decision easily. But in general, I discourage that other services discharge patients with positive smear after two weeks because they may still be shedding uh, viable bacilli and they may infect others. Uh, so if, if uh, the clinician is competent, competent enough and experienced enough to make the decision that this is likely to be limited TB and did bacilli, then we accept that we discharge the patient. But generally, I don't agree with discharging a patient with positive smear unless you're sure that the bacilli are not growing. And now with the new culture techniques, the culture takes only a week or 10 days to be positive uh, using the midget system or, or uh, other systems that we use in the university, liquid media. So it, it grows really fast, like in, within seven, 10 days. So you can have an answer as to whether this patient is safe to go home or not. If the smear is positive and the culture is negative, then it is dead bacilli. Then you don't have to worry, you can discharge the patient. But if it grew on culture, then you should not discharge it. What we did here, we discouraged uh, people sending patients home if they are smear positive because of because of the source of the infection in 80% of our patients from the present. That's why we discouraged uh, the medical team from discharging the patient after two weeks. Prisoner, you send him back, he come back to you uh, with the uh, MDR. So that's why we discouraged the medical team to discharge him. However, there is a committee now, it's very, uh, uh, there is a committee now uh, that is very uh, active, led by Dr. Abdul Aziz bin Saeed in uh, Wazara. Where Dr. Ara Tamara, uh, she's involved with it, uh, with that with that project, and she visited us last week, and she's expecting a feedback from Dr. Nawal Sharawani within uh, this week as well. So there will be some action that we'll see it soon. I had the same problem in the app. Line of demarcation is a fair and sound line of demarcation between suspected cases and the uh, probable cases. And I found in your materials, I think, uh, I'm not sure belongs to what speaker, that there is difference or separated item for suspected cases and probable cases. 
The question is, is there a sound line of demarcation between these two cases? It looks yes. to me as... Yes, actually, uh, the, uh, this case definition is used in, in African countries. We don't use it here. We have the case definition we have has only two categories, suspect and confirmed. We don't have probable. Probable in, in African countries is different from suspect by the fact that a probable case is somebody presenting with the syndrome of viral hemorrhagic fever, say fever and bleeding, uh, or, or other features of the viral hemorrhagic fever, plus history of contact with an Ebola case. So if you have this history, then he's a probable case. But if this patient presents you with viral hemorrhagic fever, without history of contact with somebody with Ebola, then you consider him as a suspect. So the history is, is the key. If the patient has contact with somebody who had Ebola, say somebody was admitted to us with confirmed Ebola, and somebody, a healthcare worker who had contact with him, 10 days later presented with fever and bleeding, then we would consider him as probable until we confirm it. But if somebody else visited, say, Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, and he did not give us history of, of having contact with somebody with with uh, Ebola, like the, the one we had here, no clear contact with somebody with Ebola, and he presents with viral hemorrhagic fever, then we could we, we'll consider him as suspect. Actually, exactly. I would love to have a question. No, no. Exactly the cases that we had in the hospital here, the first case was a suspect case, and the second case was a probable case, because he had a contact of a uh, patient, to, to a patient with, let's assume that the second, the first case was positive, assume it's positive, then the second case would have known, would have, would have defined as a probable, because he had a con yes, yes, yes. No, we don't want to confuse people here, as, as Prof. Tarek said, we will just stick to suspect and confirm. What is the infectivity period for the patient and at what time he is non-infectious? Uh, the patient is infectious throughout uh, the symptomatic stage of his illness and for men it was shown that semen may remain infectious for up to two months or 62 days. Semen. مستشفى تبرج العام هل وسائل التشخيص متاحة في كل المستشفيات؟ No, no, none of none of the hospitals in, in Saudi Arabia, not even King Faisal Specialist Hospital or National Guard. No, it's not available. The only the only facility where Ebola virus can be tested, but unofficially, unofficially, is in King Abdulaziz University Hospital. Yes. Uh, by a free lab uh, and a special pathogen uh, lab in, in King Abdullah University. And this is not official. We don't do it officially. And we're not allowed to do it uh, by, by law. So we, we send it to, to the CDC and the uh, German uh, Robert Koch Institute in Germany for uh, verification. Because this is what, what the WHO wants us, wants all countries to do. شكرا دكتور طارق على المحاضره الجميله نسال حضرتك بس عن الهيلثي كاريرز في في يعني برسنتج اوف هيلثي كاريرز اور نو ان ذا ايبولا امونج هيومنز امونج هيومنز نو نو ذير از نو هيلثي كارير ستيت بس ان انيمالز يس ديفينتلي بيكوز انيمالز ار ذا ريزيرفوارز اوف اوف ذيس فايروس لايك باتس ذا فود باتس وود كاري ذا فايروس فور فور لونج تايم but humans no, they don't carry. The, uh, my other question, because I'm an uh, intensivist and a spe specialist in intensive care, uh, do we have to start the, the treatment? I heard from the lecture that you are going to uh, يعني import the medicine, which is already under uh, uh, testing, or but we are going to use it. Yes, uh, if, if we use it, we'll use it as part of a trial, clinical trial, to evaluate its, its benefit and, and safety. Ah, so so, so confirmed case only to, should receive the meds? 
or highly suspected cases? Well, highly suspected cases may be initiated on the treatment pending uh, results. Uh, and the earlier the give the medicine? Absolutely. The earlier the better. If you the better the result. Okay, thank you. Anywhere uh, in Saudi Arabia, would they have all the SOPs who are contacting you? They got the numbers, they got the nearest center, so all these kind of information, is it available for other hospitals uh, in Saudi Arabia? Yeah, I mean, like, let's say we got a suspected case in, let's say, Al Baha or Abha or something, like in the western region uh, or south region, would they know, like, would they contact you immediately to arrange for facility transport or whether, if they have all the facilities available, would they start to uh, basically take the patient in and treat them and so on? Or every case has to be transferred to the allocated centers, is my question. Well, as part of our preparedness, we created the CCC, Command and Control Center which is led by the minister himself, and uh, Anis is assisting him uh, in leading this command and control center. In that center, we have 937 number, where if, if you have an emergency, you can directly call 937, and if it is regarding an infectious disease problem, like uh, Ebola or MERS corona, then they will connect you to, to one of the consultants in infectious disease. I'm, I'm one of them. We ha also have other other infectious disease consultants in, in the team, like Dr. Abdullah Siri and, and others. Uh, so they will connect you to, to us. For example, I, I got called last night at 3 a.m. from 937, because there's uh, somebody in, in Hyde with, with malaria, but they thought that it, it could be uh, Ebola, so we discussed the case, etc. So th this is yeah, happening 24-7 uh, throughout the year. Yes. In your hospital, you are responsible to notify the regional directorate of your city. You must report there. If you try to contact me directly, because it happened, the probable case, which is the second case, the other hospital contacted us directly. What I did, I informed Dr. Khalid that there is a case somewhere, and they took care of the patient, and even when we accepted the case, through them, right. through the public health office. So, so the, the next question is, like, um, let's say at the nurse level, at the transportation level, and all the other levels, are uh, the SOPs are distributed of like the guidelines and everything? So every hospital, I mean, does every hospital have these guidelines? The infection control in every infection? hospital they do okay. have. It. Yes, it was distributed. It was communicated to all infection control uh, department in all hospitals. Okay. Yeah. Um, can Ebola virus penetrate healthy skin? It got in contact with the uh, fluid, or it needs to be broken skin. Uh, well, it's very unlikely that a virus would be able to penetrate an intact skin. But you can, you should never assume that your skin is intact, because you can actually miss a small abrasion in your skin, or you may have dermatitis or a minor injury that make your skin exposed to any virus, be it HIV or whatever. So the standard precautions dictate uh, to us that we should uh, wear gloves uh, whenever you anticipate uh, touching fluids. Even if your skin is intact, you have to, to be careful. Uh, what precautions for the patient so that he or she will not be able to spread virus? Uh, is a good question. It's an opportunity to say a hadith on uh, Rasulullah Sallallahu uh, Alaihi uh, Wasallam. He said, uh, uh, If you heard of, of plague, which is an infectious disease that may be transmitted from human to human, you heard of, of any infectious disease in, in any area, then don't travel or don't go to that area. And if you happen to be there, then do, don't go out of that area. So it's our responsibility as, as patients and as people. If you happen to be in an epidemic center, 
don't try to fly out or to flee from, from this out because you may spread it to other countries. And and Rasulullah I think if we stick to it, Ebola would not really uh, spread to other countries. Because it's usually spread by people trying to flee from 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 the epidemic. Uh, in addition, we, we should also uh, report if, if somebody happened to be in an epidemic area and he gets any symptoms, he should immediately seek medical advice to, 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 to have an early diagnosis made and to be isolated right away before the infection is spread to his household or his, his neighbor. Uh, how long will uh, Ebola virus survive on a dry surface like bed sheet or chairs? Tables uh, infected with Ebola virus at room temperature. Uh, I'm not aware of any special information on, on this. What I know about the virus is that it is not a hardy virus. It's uh, easily disinfected by the usual surface, surface disinfectants. Unlike, for example, hepatitis B virus, which can survive for, for weeks. Uh, influenza virus can survive, and MERS coronavirus can survive for at least two days to three days. Uh, Ebola, um, I don't have any data that I have come across, but it's it's not really very hard to virus. It can be easily disinfected. Uh, from 1976, Ebola is there. Why until now there is no medicine for Ebola? Good question. Because it's the disease of the poor countries. If it has affected countries like the states, then they would have developed treatment long ago and a vaccine long ago. And now they started to think seriously about this mistake that they did. Because now the disease is, uh, may spread potentially to anywhere. So now they, they started to, to take it seriously. And the same for malaria, the same for TB. I'm sure if, if, if the developed countries took this infection seriously, they would have developed uh, vaccines and treatment long ago. Uh, do the religious habits have a role in prevention and control of the disease? Does what? The religious habits. Uh, like what? Well, I'm, 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 I'm. No, to prevent and help in control. Yes, of course. Yes. And I, 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 I thought you were asking the other way around. Adat al-diniya. Taban fi adat diniya. Very, very harmful. But my, my Islam. Diniya fil matan fi Afriqiya. They have some rituals that they, they eat the brain, for example, of of the very close family who who died, just to they they break the head and they eat the brain. And they, they get strange disease like onion, onion, and kuru, etc. Uh, so the, these are religious habits, bad religious habits, not non-Islamic religious habits can, that can lead to infections. And also eating uh, wild animals like uh, rodents, these are non-Islamic. So such habits may, may, may lead to infection. Alhamdulillah in Islam, we don't have such problems. Blacks Islam taught us very, very important principles that protect us from infectious diseases. One of them is this hadith, hadith that I just mentioned that we should not go into a country where, or an area where we have a, a, a plague or an infectious disease. And if we happen to be there, we should not uh, move out. Uh, last question. What about the fetal maternal? Uh, I mean, fate of the delivered baby of a diseased mother. And unfortunately, the, the disease has mainly a care or primary care in, in, in Africa, where we haven't really had good studies on, on such uh, such host, pregnant women and the risk of maternal fetal transmission. Uh, so I'm not aware of any data that uh, that can help me answer this question. Thank you. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Tariq. Thank you, Dr. Khalid. Thank. Uh, Dr. Anis also for uh, assigning King Fahd Hospital to, to, to do this uh, event. And uh, we'll be happy to hear any comment from uh, any uh, attendee view the, uh, through the uh, website or uh, 
and uh, thanks a lot everybody